Okay, welcome to the future of classics. Um, as you see, we're, uh, we're already trying to uh, change the geography of the room. Uh, we felt that uh, since this is going to be a discussion very much driven by you guys more than by us, uh, having us way off there in a different hemisphere seemed wrong, so we've moved over here. Um, so um, let me just begin by introducing uh, everybody up here. Um, I'm Stephen Hines, University of Washington, and um, uh, I've organized this session on behalf of the SCS uh, Sesquicentennial Committee. This is the uh, third of our three special uh, panels, and uh, the special events continue. Uh, coming up this evening, uh, right in this very room at 6.15, is uh, Mary Beard's uh, lecture, uh, What is Classics? So, um, Before I introduce our three uh, regular uh, panelists, um, we're going to have a bonus speaker who will be coming up in a moment after me, uh, who is uh, Helen Collier, our own executive director of the SCS. Um, then we'll have our, our panelists, Sarah Bond uh, in the middle, uh, associate professor of classics at University of Iowa, Joy Connolly on the far end, interim president of the Graduate Center at CUNY, at the near end, Daniel Padilla Peralta, Assistant Professor of Classics at Princeton. We should have a fourth person uh, up here, who would be Ralph Hexter, Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor at UC Davis. Unfortunately, Ralph is on medical leave and unable to join us here. Uh, it was serious, but he is on the mend, and we wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, and the rest of us will do our best to represent the perspectives that he would have brought to the discussion. Uh, and our thanks uh, to Helen for stepping in uh, to allow us to enlarge our conversation in other ways. So the idea is to stage an open and free-form large room discussion of what we think the trajectories of our field, broadly defined, will and or should be, not just in the immediate future, but for the next 150 years. And this does not, of course, exclude narratives of how we got where we are now. Uh, so rather than a format of 20-minute presentations um, plus an ever-shrinking general discussion period, we decided to flip things and go with a shape uh, which would invert the traditional proportions of presentation and discussion. So hence our workshop format will be rather a large workshop, maybe a factory floor rather than a workshop. Um, the team will lead off... Um, by offering about eight minutes each of lively, thoughtful, provocative remarks. Of course, uh, we've picked people who have a lot more than eight minutes of wisdom to contribute, so um, uh, I'd be encouraging them to inject uh, further thoughts as the discussion proceeds. Um, but overall, this is all about unfettered futurology, uh, and, uh, and you are all in charge. Now, um, rather than um, interrupt the setup presentations once they begin by doing individual introductions, uh, let me introduce everybody now in a kind of collective paragraph. Everybody's been chosen here for the proven energy um, that they bring to discussions of our field and of the academy at large. All of them combine distinctive scholarly credentials with public intellectual profiles. Uh, since 2016, uh, Helen, who will uh, join us up here shortly, but then she will have to leave because she is a gazillion duties during this meeting. But since 2016, Helen has been leading our organization towards its future after prior experience running programs at the Mellon Foundation and the previous decade as a classics professor on both sides of this country. Uh, Joy and in absentia, Ralph are senior scholars who serve in leadership positions of major institutions. Sarah and Dano are early career professors who already enjoy field-wide recognition, both for their academic work and for their public outreach. Dano has a national profile as the author of an acclaimed autobiographical book on the undocumented immigrant experience, something which has fundamentally shaped his own education and early career. Sarah is a leader in online public intellectual outreach for classics, including issues of ethnicity, class, and gender in the Greek and Roman world and in the communities that study it. And this has given her also first-hand experience of the downside as well as the upside of being in the eye of the internet. Ralph, in absentia, 
was a founding member of LGBTQ Presidents in Higher Education, runs a Western State Public University with a strongly Latino-Latina student body, UC Davis, and has an interest in our field's demographic future sharpened by this. Joy runs an East Coast urban graduate campus with an atypical student demographic, CUNY Graduate Center, fueling ongoing policy work on innovation and experimentation in graduate education. Although Sarah Joy and Danielle are here primarily for their public intellectual profiles, um, let me give a shout out uh, also uh, to their work as innovators who extend the research boundaries of our field. Uh, Sarah with uh, social and legal historical work, especially epigraphic on history from below, and active promotion of digital tools, especially in the area of cartography. Uh, Joy with work on Roman ideas about aesthetics, uh, rhetoric and political action, particularly as they relate to uh, the 18th century and the modern world. And Daniel with comparative social scientific work in religious history, critical race studies, and on classical receptions in the US and in the Hispanophone Caribbean. I'm just going to uh, uh, inject one little vignette of my own as part of the setup before closing. Uh, I just finished teaching a general education honors course on the classical tradition. And of course, the very first thing I did in the course was to say that the only unproblematic word in that course title is the, <laughs> which is a pedagogic simplification because actually the most problematic word in that course title is the. I had 35 students, mostly STEM majors or intending STEM majors. For well over half of them, it was the first course they had ever had in high school or in college, wholly focused on stuff written by dead people. Now, because the rest of their education, even in the humanities, had been so heavily presentist, I was giving them their first look, not just at the likes of Hesiod, Virgil, and Ovid, but also at the likes of Alden, Keats, Milton, and indeed uh, Camoish and Petrarch. Now, that could be a glass half empty story about diminishing prospects for the study of classics in the future. But to me, uh, with these students, it was a glass more than half full story. Um, so far from seeing the course as a rear guard attempt to shore up the study of dead white European males, for most of the students, and only four of them were live white males. For most of them, this, this was a course, it was their first course, just in getting inside the heads of dead people of any time and place. And also, many of them said, their first experience of the advantages of reading a text really slowly. And if we turn out to be the last people on campus for whom these things are still really central, that may in some ways be an expansion rather than a diminution of our future role. Anyway, before we get into all the questions and talking points uh, which my panelists are about to introduce, uh, many of these will be calls to thought and action in the present and immediate future, I want to end by just urging us to keep the more than distant future in mind as well for the next um, 90 minutes and more. How do we see the long-term future of classics over the next century and a half? What are the best and worst case scenarios for how classics will be studied and experienced 50 years, 100 years, 150 years from now in our high school and university classrooms, in the arts and in the public sphere, in North America and with an eye to Joe Farrell's presidential panel last night, also beyond. Okay, so that's, that's my initial protreptic, and now uh, I'm going to hand over uh, for a uh, further little introductory setup to Helen, our fearless leader. Thank you, Stephen, for inviting me to give some opening remarks, and um, as I'm not listed on the program, I will make these very short so that you can actually hear the people that you came to listen to. Um, there are two ways to celebrate a sesquicentennial. One is to celebrate the past with a narrative of progress and declare the end of history and declare victory. 
The other is to use the sesquicentennial as an occasion to celebrate all the achievements in the field and in this organization while also looking critically at the past and actively crafting a future. And I think that's why we are all here in this room. And I hope these conversations um, will continue beyond the meeting and indeed for many years. The humanities face enormous challenges. We all know that. The languages, ancient and modern, face enormous challenges. We all know that. I'm not going to stand here and tell you what I think the vision of classics might be in the future. I don't know what it will be, and it would be arrogant in the extreme for me to do that. But I will say, to start us off here, that I hope we will approach all these questions about the future of classics in a spirit of openness and generosity. I hope we can think about all the types of contributions to classics that are not currently getting credited in our schools, colleges, and universities. I hope we can give credit as a national organization, SCS, to all the organizations and groups, regional organizations, nonprofit startups, online publications, informal collectives um, that support classics in many different ways across this country and internationally. I also hope we can find a way to stop just talking about diversity inclusion and inclusion and really listen to the voices of those who have been marginalized from the field and then act on that. And I also hope that in the spirit of openness and generosity, we can be open to and think about new pedagogical strategies and tactics and think about the scope and contours of research in our field in the 21st century and beyond. Thank you for coming to this important discussion, and I will hand over to our other speakers and discussants. Good morning. Uh, I have a bunch of notes, but they will be probably a little bit more impromptu um, and are uh, followed up by a lot of anecdotes of my experiences over the past few years. I wanted to say before we talk about the future of classics that I think that we have to begin to grapple with our past and our present before we can move forward. A good example of this was that not long ago, um, because I am head of the communications committee and work with the communications committee in order to run the Twitter feed, Facebook, and blog for the Society for Classical Studies, we have had to reflect often on whether in the field of classics we can separate the art from the artist. Right? This is something that we've thought about a lot over the past few years, particularly in the Me Too movement of the past year and a half to two years. Particularly, I would encourage the SCS to consider the legacy of people like Basil Gildersleeve. I went to the University of Virginia, and he is notoriously known to many of us who went to the University of Virginia as the man that stared down at us in the library um, in the classics department. But he was also known for writing some of the most racist and abominable columns to the Richmond Times Dispatch that we actually know of, um, defending slavery, defending the South. Um, and yet, we continue to celebrate Basil Gildersleeve within our society. What does that say to the future classicists that are coming into the field? I will tell you that it does not tell people of color that it is welcoming to them. Thinking about people like Basil Gildersleeve, but also thinking about other very influential scholars that oftentimes go silent at this meeting, that we don't talk about or that we whisper about because we know things, but we can't say them aloud. Last year, when I was at a digital pedagogy for mapping uh, panel, I was summarily cut off in the question and answer by a very prominent digital humanist when I mentioned the fact that I no longer cite Franco Moretti because of the rape allegations against him currently. Because we are still about cronyism and supporting a, a very small group of people in many ways, uh, this can oftentimes silence other people. Uh, I too uh, have had problems with whether to call people out, whether to say things, whether we should be anonymous or whether we should have a name attached to all the allegations that we put against people. But we have to think about the past of classics and the present in order to make it welcoming 
for the future. We can't have a future for classics and really do what Helen has talked about, which is to create an environment for diversity and inclusion unless we address and say and call out the, the mistakes that we're making currently and in the past. Um, to that effect, I wanted to talk a little bit um, about citations of scholars of color, of women, and people not traditionally part of the canon. Although she's not here, uh, my good friend Nisha Jr., who is at Temple University, introduced me to the phrase, lifting as we climb, which was uh, originally a phrase for uh, women of the NAACP in the late 19th century for the idea that if you cite women, if you include women of color in particular, that is how we are going to climb. And I think we can apply that to the entirety of the SCS to say that uh, moving away from only citing Theodore Momsen, from only citing William Harris, for only citing various scholars who are part of the canon, and diversifying our footnotes and thinking about how to include more people rather than following the same path that we've been led to our entire career as classicists. It's up to us to start breaking away not only in a public forum but also within our scholarship that's printed in journals and in books. Breaking away also means that we look towards outreach. Um, although I got very little credit in my tenure file and my university loves that I do it, um, I spent about 170,000 words over the past two years blogging for my own blog, for Hyperallergic, for Adelon, uh, and for Forbes.com. That means that essentially I wrote two books of blogs um, over the past two years that I got almost no tenure credit for. Um, outreach is encouraged and, of course, given kudos, but it's very hard to figure out how this goes into tenure and promotion. I would encourage the future of classics to include not only outreach as a part of the tenure and promotion guidelines that we promote within the SES as our, as our larger um, group that we look to and to encourage universities to do the same, but to uh, also set standards for digital humanities that allows for digital projects more broadly, not just outreach through digital blogs, but also through digital humanities projects like the Ancient World Mapping Center or Pelagios uh, or any of the other myriad DH projects that classicists are actively a part of to be incorporated into the SES's guidelines for tenure and promotion as a suggestion to universities to be much more um, allowing of breaking away from the simple monograph as the model for who gets tenure. Because I will tell you that even though I was hired as a digital humanist at the University of Iowa, it came down to the singular monograph. Okay. In, in the last couple of points here, I want to talk about inclusion in panels and colloquia. Um, for four years at the University of Iowa, I ran the colloquium. That was the chance for people within the university and within the community at Iowa to see what Iowa thought classics was, right? Those panels represented what we believed classics um, is and should be. When I had gone back to the colloquia for the past 10 years, I noticed that there had only been about three scholars of color um, in any of them. And so uh, I worked very hard to try and have an even number of men and women and to bring in uh, dance, to bring in dance professors, to bring in librarians, to bring in people that are outside the traditional area of classics to bring in people of color and women because sometimes these local colloquia, whether they're just the AIA meetings or whether they're the ones put on by the university, that is the face of classics on a local level. We oftentimes think of the face of classics on a huge global level here at the SES, but it begins in the local university telling people of color and women specifically that they can be a part of our field through simply presenting them with people who are not seen as the traditional classicists, i.e. white males who are older. Um, and so I, I really see the future of classics as broadening. Classics not just being Greece and Rome, but broadening to the Mediterranean, to showing our students and welcoming them to a multicultural world, but having to reflect that in our own colloquia 
um, and also within the panels. Having the SES and the people that participate in the SES refuse to be a part of manals is one reason that I started WOE, which is the Women of Ancient History. It's a comprehensive database of female ancient historians and classicists so that manals do not have to exist anymore at conferences, but also using databases and knowledge and um, speaking to other people to try and make all of the colloquia and conferences um, and anything that has a face of classics, even if it's not at the main conference, um, reflect inclusivity uh, and, and an idea that classics embraces all people. So thanks very much. Those are just some of my thoughts that I wanted to share. Thank you very much, Sarah, uh, and now Joy. And let me just say that when we move to discussion, we have two live microphones on stands there in the audience. Each of them is removable from the stand. Our hope is we can circulate the microphones around so everyone can contribute you know, from where they're sitting. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks to my fellow panelists. Thanks especially to all of you for coming. Stephen's been talking about this for the last year or so as a panel on futurology, the futurology of classics. Futurology is the study of current trends to, in order to predict future development. So I want to start uh, my comments, looking at the clock, uh, with one big trend in education that's going to be completely familiar to, to you. In fact, I think most of what I say will be familiar to you, but I hope I put a sharp edge on it. This big trend that I want to talk about first to set up with my comments about classics is the cost of higher education. It's rising, right? Just like the cost of a doctor or a lawyer. We can talk about deferred maintenance, which I just costed out on my own campus to the tune of $25 million at a chronically underfunded public university. That's on actually the low end of these estimates of costs. If you're at a richer university, you find yourself talking about the need to refurbish dorms and hire more staff. In sum, the costs of running schools are going up. Public investment in the form of taxpayer dollars is going down. Tuitions are going up. So administrators and trustees are looking to what people call growth areas, okay? Computer science, biology, neuroscience. This is the context in which we've got to see the decline of all bachelor's degrees in the humanities from about 17%, their historic high in the, 19, uh, in, in, in the US in the 1960s, that's 17% of all bachelor's degrees granted at that time. It's about 12% now. So we can talk endlessly, and I've had so many of these conversations over the last several years. We can talk endlessly about how it's not so bad, things are flat, or maybe they're getting a little bit better, or maybe they're declining, but it's not that bad. It's just about as hard to get a job now as it was in the 90s, right? Really? It, it's not so bad. And our classes, okay, our majors are going down, but enrollments in general education courses are, are going up a little bit, so it's not so bad. That's not true, okay? I'm here to say classics is a field, it's not in growth mode, and that's the mode we need to be in to survive in the contemporary university, and certainly if we want to be alive 50 years, 100 years, 150 years out. We won't be standing here in 20 years. Our descendants won't be standing in the SES meeting in 100 years, uh, I think, if we stay the way we are now. So, the future of classics, in my view, in the form of hiring tenure track lines in the next generation, in the form of sustaining libraries and databases, in the form of sustaining research funds, and also the future of classics as a pure good in and of itself rests on teaching more students. How do we find those students? Again, we can't continue as we are. So we've got to decide afresh, each and every one of us in this room and beyond and around the world in classics, we've got to decide what we want our field to be because the field as it is is not attracting sufficient students to justify our continued existence. And again, I don't want to lose sight of the greater good here, the, uh, the essential good of the field, in, in my view, uh, justifiable uh, on its own. But that's not enough of an argument to rest on. We've got to. You know, especially those of us lucky enough to be tenured faculty, we've got to put more of our energy into attracting students in numbers that justify our replacements when we retire. And again, tenure track replacements. To deans who remember are struggling to find enough instructors to teach the undergraduates beating down the doors in computer science and communication studies. Now there's no one answer to this. We've got to have different strategies in rich universities and poor ones, in large, in large research universities and small colleges, and I'll come back to this in a minute. 
The good news is though we can do it, I believe. We have the energy as a field to grow and we have some very interesting positive trends to guide us. Uh, ben Schmidt, an assistant professor at Northeastern who's uh, been focusing on enrollments in history in the last few years, ran a linear re regression to understand the massive decline in history degrees uh, that's occurred since 2003. Among the factors he found that best predicts the heaviest declines in history enrollments uh, and history degrees are being a school that's a research university, uh, that's having a large number of Asian American or foreign students, interestingly, and also having high tuition. If you fit these, if you uh, fulfill, if you have these factors as a school, you're, high, you're at higher risk of seeing decline uh, if you're a historian uh, in the students in your classrooms. But lighter declines are, still declines, but lighter ones, so this is a positive trend, are associated with having more African American students in your school, more multiracial or Hispanic students in your school, being a historically black college or university, and interestingly, experiencing an overall growth in students. Now this overall growth in students pushes against uh, the pressure on administrators to have small, exclusive, uh, smaller colleges or universities and making the most of their admission statistics that privilege exclusivity over inclusivity. And let's remember one more factor, another positive trend that we need to make the most of, that enrollments and majors in the humanities are growing significantly in one area of higher education we don't talk enough about, and that's community colleges. That's one area where humanities and majors and enrollments are growing. So the future of classics is really ours to make. We have choices in front of us. And my question to us is, will we choose as a field to make the most of these positive signs that we see? So I say, I'm echoing Sarah here, uh, that we broaden. Uh, let's forget the label, for one thing, classical reception, and just call it classics or classical studies. Let's imagine a field, and now I'm getting to a more provocative territory I know, where language study is not the core, but where our courses in translation are so popular, we can argue to support tiny language courses, because they will always now be tiny. And let's remember, too, that a lot of administrations are not going to support that solution. So we'll come back to that in a second. So I'll end my, my comments with three questions that I would just design to get us, get us talking today. How do we think about how we, faculty, st graduate students, also undergraduates, but most importantly, faculty and grad students, how do we choose our research topics? How do we choose what to write about? What audience do we have in mind? How big is that audience? How big should it be? I think the audience should include readers from outside the, the field or outside the academy all the time. And we should shape moments like the choosing of the dissertation topic accordingly. The standard dis dissertation prospectus defense, to take one example, could include, should include in my view, a moment for the student in the committee to reflect upon the contribution of the dissertation to public knowledge, to the undergraduate experience, or making genuinely new scholarly discoveries. This capacious definition, I'm convinced, includes uh, our capacity to preserve and sustain and grow the study of skills, highly specific skills like papyrology, uh, epigraphy, and crucially, language skills. Come back again to that in a second. My second question, why are so many dissertations written on Greek poetry and prose of the 6th to the 4th centuries BCE and Latin poetry and prose of the 1st centuries BCE and CE and so few on other periods and modes, notably late antiquity, neo-Latin, indigenous writing in the Americas, and genres like technical writing, a crucial piece of the history of science? What are the drivers of that contemporary scholarly canon? And how might we, how should we redefine or rethink that canon? And I come back again, let's get rid of the, the label classical reception and just call it classics because classics in my view is the study not just Greek and Roman texts, I'd say not even just the Mediterranean, but all those people who, who have devoted their lives and energies uh, to studying those texts in between uh, them and us, so to speak. And my last question, the languages and the role of Latin and Greek pedagogy in classics. Classics is like no other field in its heavy emphasis on Greek and Latin language training. Should enrollments not sustain small language classes, and I'm gonna say my suspicion is in 50 years they won't, we've got to imagine a couple things, I think. A top-ranked department that everyone agrees is top-ranked on the model of a typical East Asian studies or Spanish, Hispanic, Latino studies department in the US today where the languages are taught by lecturers with specialized language pedagogy skills or outsourced to 
to things like the CUNY Latin and Greek Institute. And we should say this with a smile. This should be a value, okay? We should not require all archeologists, historians, historians of thought, philosophers, and visual culture specialists to teach Greek and Latin. Here's the paradox as I see it. Faculty and small programs are under enormous pressure to teach everything, including Latin and Greek at all levels, and creative courses designed to attract all manner of undergrads. Yet still, classics enrollments are typically flat or falling. I think the field would be better served by training a next generation of faculty, free and empowered to focus on teaching topics of broader interests. I throw out one final thought, and that's that uh, I see classics really as interestingly potentially reformed as a version of American studies, and that's a, another provocative provocation I'll leave out there. I want to end with a complicated thinker uh, with a complicated legacy, especially as it comes to race, and that's Hannah Arendt. She wrote in her essay, Tradition in the Modern Age, there is a small track of non-time which the activity of thought beats within the time space of mortal men and into which the trains of thought, of remembrance and anticipation, save whatever they touch from the ruin of historical and biographical time. This small non-time space in the very heart of time, unlike the world and the culture into which we are born, can only be indicated but cannot be inherited and handed down from the past. Each new generation, indeed each and every new human being, as he inserts himself between an infinite past and an infinite future, must discover and plottingly pave it anew. So let's get on to paving. Thanks. Thank you, Joy. And finally, Danel. I got slides, yeah. Where is the core? Hmm. Where's the, where is it? It's right here. Ah, there we go. I'm a digital humanist. <laughs> All right, crisis averted, so good. This is the future, fumbling with technology. Let's see. All right, can everyone see? All right, so it's daunting uh, to bat clean up behind my co-panelists, but I'll do my best to knock some base runners home. My original plan was to offer some remarks on non-paradigmatic future verb forms in Greek, but I think you are all expecting somewhat different fare. So for the next few minutes, uh, I want to concentrate on the systemic marginalization of people of color in the credentialed and accredited knowledge production of the discipline. Already in the historical practice of convening this conference in locations and hotel and conference centers that are not only ludicrously expensive to travel to, but that are rife with micro and macro aggressions that target people of color, the SES does folks of color no favors. And here I pause to mention the revolting racial profiling yesterday by hotel staff of Jessica Watson and Stephanie Echeverria Dixon, co-founders of the Sportula. Those of you on Twitter who have heard of the incidents and seen the video that they uploaded will have had an opportunity to reflect on how alienating these spaces continue to be for people of color. However, the SCS chooses to call the hotel staff of the Marriott to account for yesterday's heinousness, we should remember that holding our hotel and conference venues to a racially equitable standard and not letting them off the hook once they promise to do better or trot out whatever corporatized language of banalizing non-responsibility suits them is only a first step. The longer term steps all involve committing to the advancement of folks of color and of the collaborative ventures that emerge to support their work and legitimate their standing in ways that this center and displace white privilege and supremacy from its position of preeminence and priority in the discipline's self-image. So support the sportula. This statement brings me now to the purpose of my remarks for the remaining seven minutes. I want to look at a blinding derangement the responsibility of the major journals in the field for the replication of those asymmetries of power and authority that impoverish knowledge production in the field of classics by perpetrating the epistemic and hermeneutic injustice of denying a space and a place to scholars of color. The motivation for the data harvesting project behind these remarks arose from attempting to cultivate the habit, practice to genuinely emancipatory effect by several of you in this room and on this panel, I thank Sarah, of assembling syllabi and bibliographies that meet as demanding a standard of citational justice as possible. 
and of meditating upon the collection of undergraduate and graduate syllabi and bibliographies that I've obsessively curated over the years, partly with an eye to mapping the major landmarks of authorized knowledge production in this field. How many women scholars appear on these syllabi? How many people of color? How many women of color? Although not normally included in the dossier of his most explicitly racist words and deeds, Gildersleeve's founding of AJP in 1880 has helped to shape American classical scholarship by spurring the development of a journal-centered disciplinary culture that has proven remarkably, if unsurprisingly, resistant to the pursuit of racial diversity and equity as a core objective. Let me put this another way. If one were intentionally to design a discipline whose institutional organs and gatekeeping protocols were explicitly aimed at disavowing the legitimate status of scholars of color as producers of knowledge, one could not do better than what classics has done. In illustration of this point, I want first to recognize and center gender disparity in the publication trends of three major journals, TAPA, AJP, and CA, before proceeding to some data on the racial and ethnic backgrounds of the individuals published in these journals. I've compiled about 20 years worth of data, and I'll say more about how I collected the data on racial and ethnic background in a moment. For now, I want to look at the gender disparities of the flagship journal of the SCS, TAPA. As you'll see on this slide, not all that much has changed in the past two decades. In the five-year period from 1997 to 2001, 36% of author appearances were by women. This figure dropped to 28% in the next five-year interval, rose to 31% in the next five-year period, and crawled up to 37% in 2012 to 2017. Matters don't improve when we turn to AJP, which as a quarterly offers many more slots for publication from a low watermark of 27% in 1997, 2001. That per the percentage of women author appearances climbed to 41% in the next five year interval before descending to the 30s for the decade from 2007 to 2017. Meanwhile, classical antiquity, which at one point came closest to achieving gender parity, has trended downward on this front from a high of 46% in 97 to 2001 to 37.5% in 2012 to 2017. What factors account for this? Editors at several of the journals have complained about the gap between the volume of submissions by men and the volume of submissions by women. And from some of the editorial letters, one gets the sense of a shrugging of the shoulders. Yes, we're trying, but it's just so very hard. Certainly, we need to talk about what constitutes meaningful effort to redress this imbalance and to contend with the fact, undoubtedly obvious to many of you in this room, that men continue to receive more explicit encouragement to submit to journals, especially men early career uh, publication records, than women. But the extraordinary discretionary power wielded by editors should also be subjected to scrutiny too, and I hope that we will discuss this during the Q&A. For now, let me end by noting that discretionary power can and should be flexed to progressive consequence and outcome. In 2018, when only 3% of Adelon's authors were tenured men, the journal published twice as many women as men. The significance of editorial discretionary power comes into starker relief when we turn to the racial and ethnic makeup of the publication rosters of TAPA, AJP, and CA, the bleakness of which may not surprise some of you in attendance, but which still deserves quantitative exposition. For all authors who published in these journals from 1997 and 2017, I conducted searches and over the internet to establish their racial and ethnic background to the extent that I could, digging into publicly available information on parents, family, marriages, obituaries, DUIs, uh, whenever I could pin it down. <laughs> Such was the volume of searches from my laptop that Google repeatedly prompted me to confirm that I was not a robot, and perhaps I am. I group scholars into the following racial and ethnic categories, white American, US slash Canada, white European, lumping in, uh, lumping in with them non-Canadian British Commonwealth folks, black African American or Afro-Caribbean, East Asian, Asian American or Asian Canadian, indigenous Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, a Middle Eastern South Asian category that I chose, uh, that I used to include Israeli Palestinian scholars in addition to Indian subcontinent ones, Hispanic or Latin X, and that always convenient other unable to determine for those authors who eluded the surveillance gaze of my internet searches. The hegemony of whiteness is everywhere in evidence across the three journals, 
For TAPA, in the period from 2012 to 2017, 91% of author appearances were by white American or white European scholars. And improvement, a word I use advisedly, on the 98% to 96% to 97% white composition of the author pool for the previous intervals. During this 20 year period, figures for the white composition of the AJP author pool have bounced around from 94.5% to 97% to 94% to 97%. And the classical antiquity hasn't cleared the 90% threshold either. The corresponding figures have bounced back and forth from 91% to 96%. Although I will note in the Pokemon tokenizing spirit, that classical antiquity is the only one of the journals to feature authors in every single one of the categories during one of the temporal brackets. These percentages remind me of nothing so much as the figures for those intensely segregated suburbs that define the childhood and adolescent years of my partner. Publication in elite journals and classics is a whites only neighborhood. By now, the solution minded among you will want to hear some possibilities floated for how to rectify this for the well being and the future of the discipline. Despite my strong preference for playing the shame wizard to this crowd over and above drawing up some action plan, I do want to close by nodding in the direction of the American Historical Review's call to decolonize itself in an editorial letter published by Alex Lichtenstein a year ago. This editorial combines a plan of action with a forthright diagnosis of the journal's complicity, and here I'll quote directly, quote, in the inability of the profession to divest itself fully of its past lack of openness to scholars and scholarship due to race, color, creed, gender, sexuality, nationality, and a host of other assigned characteristics, end quote. This editorial letter is a moving document, and I would urge all of you to read it. As far as I'm concerned, the most fundamental question for the future of knowledge production in classics is this. How do we recognize honor and repair the silencing of the knowledges that people of color carry? How do we perform and validate and support the reparative epistemic justice that the discipline so sorely needs? It's here that I will insist on a slight corrective to the glittery discourse of inclusion. For this reparative epistemic justice to take hold, holders of privilege will need to surrender their privilege. And in practical terms, this means that in an economy of academic prestige defined and governed by scarcity, white men will have to surrender the privilege they have of seeing their words printed and disseminated. They will have to take a back seat so that people of color and women and gender nonconforming scholars of color benefit from the privileges, career and otherwise, of seeing their words on the page. Again, however, I emphasize that this is an economy of scarcity that at the level of journal publication will remain to a degree zero sum, until and unless the system of publication is dismantled, which would be fine by me. Every person of color who is to be published will take the place of a white man whose words could have or had already appeared in the pages of that journal, and that would be a future worth striving for. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so uh, for anybody who came in uh, late, uh, let me just um, uh, reintroduce the uh, three folks up front here, Daniel Padilla Peralta, Sarah Bond, Joy Connolly. Uh, let me tell you that we have two microphones there. Um, if you want to talk, you can either go up and talk at the microphone or pick up the microphone, bring it to your seat, and we'll pass the microphone uh, around as we speak. And apologies to everybody who's having to sit on the floor here. You know, we, we did think this would be a large session. Uh, given how many parallel sessions there are, how many friends of mine couldn't come because there are other panels, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted so many people have come, but I'm, I'm sorry you're not sitting more comfortably. Anyway, so we have so many things to talk about. Uh, who speaks? Who is published? What is published? Where is it published? And who are the we going to be who will decide these things over the next 10, 20, 50, 100 years? Okay, over to you. <laughs> Is it on? Uh, I'm just curious, by poll in the room, uh, going to Joy's comment about teaching the languages, how many people teach a language as an overload unpaid? Yeah, and I think this is probably the case even more so for smaller universities. Probably, uh, I don't know how many people are contingent faculty, uh, but it strikes me as 
being another one of the major issues that we need to address in the field, I wonder if cutting back on the language courses we offer is the way to fix this uh, problem in terms of the business model of how industries, uh, or the business model of how universities work, um, or if there's another way. So, th so this is a, a question that I give to the panel or to others who want to come join. I think I'll just add as I wait for others to answer that question that I, the choice is not entirely ours, right? Because unless we want to continue the economy of teaching overloads that are unpaid, uh, uh, we won't have choices in the matter, I think, in, in 10 or 20 years because those classes just won't be offered and it won't be our choice not to offer them. Unless we do things differently. Um, hello, can you hear me? Okay, I'll probably offend all of you. Um, I had three, three main things that I wanted to say. Um, and to, to actually to preface that, I'll add a fourth, which is I don't think you should abandon the languages. So if you abandon the languages, we don't have anything left. You're just destroying the, the, the entire, um, the entire discipline. You can't teach history without knowing something of the languages. You can't teach literature without knowing something of the languages, or we don't have classics. So to say it's inev inevitable is a real problem. And so that brings me to my first point, which is for 30 years I've heard you talk about the need for diversity and inclusiveness and reaching out and doing women in the ancient world and all sorts of other areas, which is fine. It's interesting. It's important. And people who can do that well should do it. But maybe we should start defending our discipline in of itself and saying it's Western civilization, it matters because it's the West. Western civilization it's is everything. a construct. It, okay, that's it matters. Construction. It, it's, it's important, particularly in its focus on liberty, democracy, and freedom. Okay. We need to stand up for it and say we are Western Civ. Up until 100 years ago, we, we aren't Western Civ. We're not. No. Then we might as well just Western, we might as well just shut down. Then I taught Western okay. Civ for many, my many point years is, can as I a finish? historian. Can I finish my point? Okay, I know you're very important. You're all very important, but that's not the point. We should defend our discipline to the administration, to whoever's giving money, to whoever's doing the hiring and say, look, we have value. We don't have to only do women's studies, only do ethnic studies, only do a balkanization of our, of our field. We have value in and of itself. And secondly, I think that you should, I know, shocking, maybe try doing the classic classes, classics, okay? To Professor Hines' point, which is really important, the kids that come in don't know anything. They don't know what's available. They don't know what classics is. They don't know what, they don't know anything about anything. And if you can give them a survey course, you can give them a freshman great books course and incorporate classics in that. You can expose them to the greats. That's really, really important. Okay, we don't teach Homer. We don't teach Cicero. I teach them every semester. In English? As a survey, yes, undergraduate I do. English. I have a history. PhD. Most departments don't. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. So I would like to no, respond. No, no. I, I looked I it really, up. I, I think it's time that we get to respond because I think you're. I, I think you're spreading a lot of falsities that I've. Uh, it's a it's a falsity to say why don't we teach Thucydides and Herodotus? I teach. Why don't we I teach? Just, finished teaching Thucydides in Greek for the Greek survey, and then I taught him in English. You cannot say across the board that I we aren't teaching I am saying across Thucydides. the board. The University of California Davis, Professor Hexter isn't here. The classics in English courses consist of mythology and vocabulary, and that's it. Okay? okay. okay. So I'm saying right. Cicero has value. Homer has value. Demosthenes Absolutely. has value because it will teach you about defending democracy. But people don't want that, okay? Right. You've listed all men um, the, of the authors that you would prefer us to read, by the way. Um, I, I am not say, a socialist, I, okay? I, I, I believe in merit. I believe that the right. journals okay. have articles on the basis of merit. R right. I, I don't you. look at you, the color of the author. And you, and you don't think that Sappho has merit. <laughs> Okay, you may, have got you, you may have got your job because you're black, 
but I would prefer to think you got your job because of merit. Yeah, we okay. saw that coming. Say the truth. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, and I think we should allow other people to um, participate in this conversation at the risk of having this conversation uh, hijacked, but what I'll say simply is that if, if this vision of the classics is the vision that you find uh, uh, as a person. You're saying that, as, that, as, that as, as people a, of color, black let me people, finish. I let people you, I, I let you, I let you, I let you finish. They're so not now capable. I, I did not interrupt you once. So you are going to let me talk. You are going to let someone who has been historically marginalized from the production of knowledge in classics talk. And here's what I have to say about the vision of classics that you've outlined. If that is in fact the vision that affirms you and your white supremacy, I want nothing to do with it. I hope the field dies that you've outlined and that it dies as swiftly as possible. And I hope, I fervently hope, that those of you in the room will take stock and consideration of what has happened here. That I, thought, I, thought that 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 I, I thought that I would be able to speak. Right. Yeah. I, thought, I thought that I, I would be able to the, speak rather than to be marginalized. In the interest of equity. But I obviously, you your field has decided that there's only a certain point of view. Go for it. Go for it. There's uh, obviously a lot to respond to, and uh, I've got to calm down a little bit. Um, I will say, because, again, this is something I shared on the evening of the Louis Alfaro lecture. I was chair of the classics department. And we went through uh, prioritization, um, which was essentially an administrative move to evaluate every single department, every single program, based on a series of different metrics that we're all familiar with, faculty to student ratio, enrollment numbers, but also things like number of students entering into the college who are interested in, who express an interest in classics. And I can tell you that number is essentially zero. But the point is this, we made every impassioned argument that we could about the inherent value of the classics, whatever that is. And everyone said, that is a really great argument, but let's look at the numbers. And when you look at the numbers, they don't add up. Believe me, we were doing everything that we could. We offered the uh, uh, service courses that were fully enrolled. And we try to use those fully enrolled service courses as a justification then for the unremunerated overloads that we were doing for the language courses to keep those majors going. And the point was, and the argument that we made was, this is for our students. We are willing to sacrifice our time, scholarship, everything that goes into preparing to teach courses for our students. But when it comes down to the numbers, it just doesn't add up. And so in administration, and in some ways, perhaps it makes sense, they would look at what we were doing and they would say to us, this is unsustainable. And so what happened? We were prioritized. All of our language programs were, uh, major programs were eliminated. We fortunately saved them as minors, but by eliminating those major programs, then a tenured colleague uh, was ultimately dismissed from our department. Colleges can justify letting go tenured faculty if programs are cut. And that's exactly what happens. And I'm going to tell you this, colleagues and friends, that's going to happen again. It's going to happen more and more. It might not happen, let's say, at some of our more elite institutions, but at the small liberal arts college, the state university, local um, institutions of higher learning, this is a trend that is going to continue if there is even a classics program in some of those places. I'm not going to address some of the things that were just said in terms of dealing with uh, issues about whatever the Western heritage or Western civilization, I just sort of speaking to you as a person of color and a classicist, but also from a very practical point of view, from a person who went through the elimination of the programs that we hold so dear. If we just keep our heads in the sand, I'm afraid it, um, we are in that death spiral and it's just going to continue. Classics will survive at some of these places, but in the small schools, in the places where we want to reach out most, Ultimately, I think that we have already lost the battle. So uh, that's my comment, and I'm, I'm calm now, but man, that was tough. <laughs> uh, young, <laughs> uh, 
Young has, a, I think, a lot more diplomacy than I have and has for many years <laughs> since I've known him. So thank you uh, for that. Um, my comment about the construction of Western civilization comes from the fact that I have a PhD in history, not in classics. Um, I started off in a history department at Marquette and then went to classics at the University of Iowa to teach languages and history. Um, I taught Western Civ for many years at UNC Chapel Hill um, as a TA for, for many different uh, historians who are modern historians and then taught it at Marquette. And how I started every Western Civ class is that Western civilization is a construction of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and I think that's something, the idea of Western civilization has been manipulated by congressmen like Steve King from my very own Iowa, how I wish he was not my congressman. Um, and uh, he has used the very pernicious idea of Western civilization to support white supremacy. That is why I wanted to interrupt and call her out on the use of it to defend classics, because I don't see myself as part of Western civilization. I see myself as someone who comes uh, from, from America, um, but that Western civilization is itself um, something that was created, particularly during World War I, to connect us um, to uh, the soldiers that were fighting in World War I, and was a course that was then created and popularized during the early 20th century. So that, that is where my interruption came from, although um, I have many qualms with that diatribe. Just really quickly, if anyone took my comments about the decline or the you know, small size in language classes as inevitable or impossible to struggle against, I absolutely did not mean that. And I also didn't, I did not mean, intend my comments to suggest that I believe or find it a good to get rid of language teaching. I, what we need to do is think creatively and differently about how we configure the field. I just want to be very clear of where I was coming from on that. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'd like to go in a different direction um, and I hope that we return to this conversation. But um, as a graduate student, one thing that is um, very important for me is being hopeful <laughs> about my future. <laughs> um, and Hope is the thing with feathers. <laughs> and hopeful about the future for other graduate students as well, beyond myself. Um, and I think one thing that I would really love to see the field do more of is um, incorporate more kind of networking events where people who have a background in classics or don't have a background in classics and are working in different fields are brought into relation to graduate students. Um, there is a networking event that I have to run to soon. <laughs> um, but I also want it to not be a sort of shameful thing because I'm still very interested in a possible future as a professor as well, but I don't want that to be my only path um, and I would love to see graduate programs do things where they're bringing in people in the same way where we have a lecture with a prominent classicist come to our department and we meet them and it's wonderful. I would love to meet more people who are doing really interesting work in different fields that I can network with, that I can get to know, that I can have as a mentor um, and things like that. So a totally different direction, but um, that's what I'm hopeful about. Thank you very much. Were you going to respond to my predecessor, yeah. or I don't know. you want me to go ahead? Okay. Uh, actually, it, I sort of bounce a little bit off what she was just saying because how's that? Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm a little bit bouncing off what my predecessor just said, or, or was talking about. Um, but I also uh, have been thinking about this, particularly because of your comments, Joy. Um, I'm just wondering what the implications are uh, if we are to follow sort of this, this vision, um, apocalyptic perhaps, but if we were to follow this vision, um, what happens in graduate school? What does graduate training look like? And one of the things that I've experienced in a very long career of teaching 
in an entirely undergraduate institution, a small liberal arts college, is that there's an increasing, I would say maybe not chasm, that might be a little bit too strong a word, but an increasing sort of differing of direction between what goes on in a large PhD granting program and what goes on in an institution where the major or at least the prime, uh, the, or perhaps even the sole audience is undergraduates. Um, and because for people like me who end up spending a career teaching undergraduates, rewarding as that is, it's something that I was not prepared for in my own graduate education. And I'm just wondering how we're going to talk about that. So I'll, I'll respond really briefly. And uh, I will be brutally brief, because uh, especially being uh, at the Graduate Center, <laughs> this is what I think about all the time. So I, I, won't, uh, I won't bore you all with or, or take too much time. Uh, with all I have to say, but I'd say let's think about three moments. I mean, I, I mentioned the dissertation prospectus uh, defense. Uh, why do we have dissertation prospectus defenses with just a committee of three or five? You know, that should be a moment where the entire, not just the entire department, but representatives, other humanists or social scientists should be present, thinking together at this crucial moment for a young classicist or ancient historian about what their first big project is going to be. Why do we keep that moment so small, and why do we not ask questions about you know, what purpose is this serving? Who's going to read this? How does this contribute to the public good? How does this advance public knowledge? So the dissertation prospectus defense, the dissertation defense too. Um, second point, really quickly, we have a program at the Graduate Center where we place uh, 10 uh, graduate students a year teaching in the in LaGuardia Community College it's the, with the support of the Mellon Foundation. Um, more of that, okay, more circulation between uh, with people teaching in, a, in associate degree granting institutions and, and research uh, R1 uh, institutions. Um, and third point, uh, how, do we t uh, how do we shape the idea of what a dissertation should look like? It's got implications for how we grant tenure. So we as a field have to think together, and this is what this disciplinary organization is for. You know, why are we, why are we still granting tenure on the same criteria we used 125 years ago? That's insane in my view. We've got to change the way we think about tenure and how we honor work in the field. Um, I just want to make a small comment with relation with respect to the uh, 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 use of numbers. And um, it seems to me inevitable and not a bad thing necessarily that administrators depend on numbers like numbers, um, have to use numbers. The job we have in classics, as I've always seen it, is to show that the numbers that count are the enrollment numbers, not the major numbers. We inevitably, as a field, and this makes us different from other fields, which is why administrators don't, often don't understand us, is that we are not, I mean, we, 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 our mission is to convey the classics to the large body of the students, not to necessarily reproduce ourselves in the numbers of majors. We'd like to have some majors, of course, continuing, but the more important number is the total enrollments. And you've got to make that case to administrators um, it, uh, that we're just different and that they can't judge us on this. It doesn't always work, but you've got to try. Uh, hello. I don't know how much I have to add to this conversation in terms of deeper thoughts about, um, you know, everything that's going on in classics right now. I'm an undergraduate. I am very new to the field. I, I don't know the shape of things, but um, I just would like to express my gratitude to all of you and to everybody in this room for engaging in this extremely important conversation because, you know, talking about, oh yeah, the future of this field, like, this is my future. I am very invested in what classics is going to look like in 20 years, um, in 10 years, in 50 years. Uh, you know, hopefully I'll still be around in 50 years coming to these conferences. I mean, I'll be old in 50 years, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> um, but I, I really, I love this field and I'm very excited about a lot of the stuff that I've been seeing happen. Um, I'm you know, a, an avid reader and follower of, of Eidolon and of other 
uh, projects that are happening that are creating a more just, diverse field and allowing us as classicists to take our the knowledge that we've gained in, in undergraduate education and in graduate school and at conferences like these and take it out into the wider world and make that world better with the knowledge that we have, um, not to replicate mistakes of the past, but to know them and improve on them. So uh, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody who's here. Um, I just wanted to mention a, a couple things is uh, uh, that there is hope um, for particularly for the graduate students and all in that uh, when, for example, Calvin cut classics, it also, it wasn't just classics, it was also music and theater, uh, yeah, German, I mean, there were lots of cuts. Um, it wasn't, classics wasn't isolated out. And I'm from uh, Grand Valley State University, so, you know, we're just a, a state university poorly funded by the state. Uh, but we have a really thriving classics department. We have, uh, uh, we have seven tenure faculty. We're doing really well. Whether we can keep up with our very low enrolled Greek, we'll see. I don't know what the future will bring. Uh, but there certainly is hope for the future. Um, uh, one of the ways that we've been able to thrive is by trying to have a finger in every pie in the university that we can. Um, so we do uh, just constant networking with every department, um, all different groups of students, um, just everything that we can. And um, that's why I think uh, bringing in Luis Alfaro was so important because the work that he is doing, that kind of bringing classics to the community, bringing the community to classics, that seems to be really crucial for our continued growth. Um, and along, just uh, one last point is I'd like to bring up the, the issue and keep asking people about the role of translation, since I'm a translator, um, but the role of translation in outreach, because that seems to be a really critical thing, the low status of translation, when really that's the only thing that we're using, mostly ex other than the students, that small group of students that we can bring to the language. So right. the status of translation is an issue. Right. Thank uh, you. I I'll speak to that only because on the blog, we started a monthly column. Um, and she's not here. She's in Virginia right now. But Adrienne Ho Rose, who does translation from Latin to Chinese, she has uh, and continues to have, because she's on the communication committee, a series on translation where she interviewed A.E. Stallings, um, Peter Green from at Iowa with us, um, because Adrian is, is at Iowa. And um, she has, has uh, interviewed recently Emily Wilson, um, and thought a lot, I, I take your point absolutely, that um, taking over for the blog, I thought a lot about things that I'm not good at. And that is recognizing and thinking about translation as an intentional act, right? And so, um, yeah, one of those things is recognizing where um, our faults were and, and where we needed to have more visibility. Um, and uh, no one in this room could say that, that Emily Wilson hasn't brought um, new blood back into the field of classics um, to think about these translations and about it as an art. And at the University of Iowa, we have the translation workshop, which of course is very famous, but we aren't included in classics. Like the translation workshop is actually very separate than classics. When Adrian came over from the translation workshop, building that bridge between the writer's workshop, this like big prestigious thing, and classics, and thinking about how much we have in common, I totally take your point. Building relationships, between departments that already do that and, and trying to underscore it. So I think you're exactly correct there and that you're right that translation can be exciting. It can be something um, to do in outreach and at least on the SES blog, and I think Adelon has also very much underscored this, um, talking about the way that we translate words um, is something that's very relevant. So do you translate doulos as a slave or as a servant, right? And that's a big question. And, and so thinking about those things and how important translation is going forward, I, I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah. I just want to put in a very, very quick thing, just uh, uh, reinforcing the, the hopeful point about um, 
you know, one thing classics departments are very good at is making themselves indispensable. You know, you know, we're a large public university. We took a big hit in 2009 uh, when they nuked the language requirement. And ever since then, we find, finding new ways to remain visible gets students back into the classroom. That's one reason I was teaching an honors seminar. You know, uh, we offer disproportionately far more of those than other humanities departments do, partly because each honors seminar generates a TA quarter for us, but also it exposes 35 hearts and minds to our field, our field broadly conceived, not just Western conceived, broadly conceived, a, 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 a world cultural field, the past, etc. Um, um, you know, and yes, we need to keep teaching our languages, but also the same kind of respect for pedagogy, which is informed classics, equally applies to our archaeologists and our philosophers. They need to be asking themselves what core freshman pedagogic skills can they bring to what if we let them all first year language teaching um, you know, I want to do it myself I like it but you know, you know what is the equivalent of first year language teaching for an archaeologist for a philosopher for a demographer um, you know you know we need to attract students who aren't aware of what we do in high school and so you know we need to give them all that ground floor and passage to the next level uh, in what we teach um, so mine's a bit of a two-parter. I think we've sort of been, been talking around this. So I was wondering if you all could speak to the dynamics of the field's existence itself in excluding, in excluding um, marginalized groups, because we talk about diversity, we talk about outreach, but very much it feels like we've proverbially walled ourselves off and, and literally in the case of separate departments and in separate buildings, and then, you know, sort of, it invite people in, and I'm wondering what the dynamics of that are, as opposed to you know having a Roman historian in a likely more diverse in terms of both faculty and majors in a history department. Um, and related to that, um, what exactly are you calling the death of the field, and and just what would that look like? Yeah, I, I, I. I the, the question sends me down all kinds of directions, um, partly because it is the kind of all-encompassing question that needs to be tackled um, um, for the reasons you mentioned. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll do the thing of sort of paratactically stringing together uh, two or three anecdotes to, to clarify what my sort of situatedness in respect to this is. I mean, setting aside you know, the, 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 the performance of white supremacy that um, occupied our attentions a few minutes ago. Um, I think that we partake of habits of expression that continuously reify distinctions between ourselves and other fields to detrimental effect uh, and detrimental consequences. So uh, I'll cite just one example right now. I mean, how, how different are we from ethnic studies or area studies? Um, and why, 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 do, why, why do we uh, imagine ourselves as, as um, somehow apart? Um, and the short answer is that we, we have developed uh, uh, technologies of distinction uh, orbiting the praxis of language teaching uh, and the fetishization of Greek and Latin in particular uh, that enable us to draw some of these bright lines. But to zero in on what I think is you know, really at the, at the beating heart of your question, I, uh, for me, one of the challenges in the future of the field, and this goes back to um, Joy's call to um, sort of decenter the languages as a sort of component element of our identity, um, is that language instruction um, and language pedagogy, if not done with a view to uh, a, a sort of uh, an ethically rigorous standard of inclusion, becomes a site for the performance of certain kinds of mastery. Um, and here I, I will avail myself of just one anecdote. Uh, which is that when I was an undergrad, especially my first two years uh, at Princeton, I would be in a room, in a seminar room, possibly even with, with Catherine Liu, um, who I see there, uh, and people would mis mistranslate. And I came from this private school background where I had been doing Latin since I was 11. And I would think to myself, ah, they are so wrong, and I am so right. <laughs> And, it, and this, and it was not just a matter of having, by that point, internalized the, the status that came with having 
the languages. Note that, that locution, having the languages, right? Um, it's that for those of us who had been beneficiaries of this structural privilege, we received continuous and endless affirmation in what we did as being rigorous. We weren't doing that anthropologically minded stuff that some of the cultural historians were doing. We were doing the languages, the languages are hard. And people fall into these traps all the time here in this setting, right? Even in talking about the work that people do, well, they do hard stuff. They, they, they zero in on the nitty gritty of the, of, of the languages or uh, aparadigmatic uh, future verb forms in, uh, in Greek. Uh, but like, I, the thing is, these are habits of speech that are very hard to break. And they are also tied to habits of practice and the teaching that we do that are very hard to break. And so at the point that any person debating whether to enter the field, uh, any undergraduate who is trying to reckon with whether he or she has a place in the field, um, invariably, especially if that person is, is a person of color, a person from a historically or, or currently underrepresented group, um, either consciously or semi-consciously, you begin asking yourself, well, do I really want to just be the master? Is that what I'm aspiring to? I, I, I want to get to the point where I can uh, practice the same kind of mastery over others? Or is there, a more, is there a more equitable way of realizing my identity as an aspirant classicist that is, is, is harmonized to an ethically demanding standard of equality and equity, right? And that's where I think the field has seriously failed. Um, is there hope for the future? Yes, I mean, I, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think there was some hope. Um, but I have many, many interactions at this conference that lead me to believe that actually this is going to be a much steeper uphill climb uh, than even I could have imagined in my most pessimistic, gloomy moments. Not, not just because, not just because you know, we can't diagnose the problems or because we don't have a sophisticated enough vocabulary for identifying the problems, but because the solutions require us to rewire every component of our identity as classicists. And for many people, that is too tough a burden to shoulder. And some people just don't want to do it. And that's fine. Maybe they'll leave the room. Um, but then, of course, you get into the space where I am also performing a practice of exclusion. right? So I, that, that's, that's all by way of saying that I take your question as an invitation to force us to think critically about the work that needs to be done. I think I want to echo Danelle's comments about about change and loss and the sense of loss that comes with change. And I would hope that we all have the courage, um, especially in a small field where so many of us know one another, to offer the support and, the, uh, and, all, and exhort one another when we need that exhortation to transform that sense of loss into a sense of gain. And, and my view, as, I, as I've been saying, is we're gaining a future when we change. Because if we stay the same, the future will not exist for us. So, that, that's my hope, that, but we would need, you know, we need constant forms of, of support uh, to, as we work our way through, especially those of us older in the field who have gained reputations in the field as it was, you know, to, to learn that the people we're teaching are, should not live in that world. It's a huge act of rewiring. I, um, I was wondering if you could share uh, some more thoughts about the connection between classics and the job market. And uh, uh, in particular, if you think that the, uh, a tenure track position should still be in the future, the, the main name of a graduate program. And uh, uh, I know that, uh, I don't have uh, exact statistics, but I know that most people, more than half, do not get uh, a tenure track. And uh, uh, so I, I was wondering, um, like being in a graduate degree, um, what were your thoughts about that? Also, uh, I was thinking that uh, for most people, what is considered a plan B, which is not staying in academia, ends up being a plan A at a certain point. And uh, um, I think that the, the programs sometimes do not help to develop uh, some skills that would be useful. For example, I don't, I don't know of any program that has a teaching certification recognized by the state included in the, um, in the five years of, of the program. And for example, another thing, for example, is the, there's a lot of emphasis on learning, having a reading knowledge of a foreign language, which is very useful if uh, you're dealing with scholarly work. But then if you're interacting with foreign people, that's less useful. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was wondering if, uh, you know, 
there, there are changes that can be made and, and there should be made and people should be helped uh, right from the beginning to develop a different plan, not when they're in the fifth, sixth, seventh year. Ab Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. So I, I'm currently DGS for, for the University of Iowa's Classics Department. Um, but as I said, I have an affiliated um, a status in the Digital Scholarship and Publishing Studio. And over at least Iowa over the past three or four years has tried to engage with a program that the NEH funded, so yeah, um, it's very precarious at the moment, called the Next Generation PhD. Um, and this was funded all over the country with a mind towards training uh, graduate students, particularly not to think of anything less than a tenure track job as a plan B. To think of lots and lots of different skills that they're developing contemporaneously and to problematize the dissertation, moving it from a PDF to include things um, like, for instance, um, Orbis, right? Thinking about network analysis, thinking about Gephi, thinking about mapping, and being able to include this as skills that you develop while you're learning to do your dissertation. Um, I didn't really realize how necessary it was to encourage, and I hate this phrase, but I, I would love a replacement for it for alternative academic uh, jobs to come about until I married a digital humanities librarian. Um, he has a PhD in James Joyce and Ulysses. There aren't that many tenure track jobs in James Joyce. Okay, um, and so he developed a, a digital pedagogy program and he got the job as the head of the digital scholarship and publishing studio. Um, and uh, he is a success story, right, in, in this idea that he went to libraries and information science, which a lot of classicists have done. Caitlin Marley is not here, um, uh, but there are many other digital humanists who have started gravitating towards libraries and information science and being trained in digital humanities. I'm not telling you that DH is going to save us, right? That was something that I think came about about 10 years ago that when there was a huge hiring uh, boom of digital humanities, it was digital humanities will save the classics, right? Um, that's not what I'm telling you, but it does allow you to open up a toolkit that you develop and then are attractive to other areas. So Patrick Burns isn't here. He's also a librarian who has a PhD in classics, um, but is someone who worked with Google, right? Um, I think you're exactly correct that we cannot think of tenure tracks as the end-all be-all, but the problem is people like me are the advisors for the graduate students, and then they idolize people with tenure track positions who are anomalous. Right? I'm the mentor and I'm advising, no. At the University of Iowa, we are not allowed to have people who aren't professors be on a dissertation committee. If you allow for librarians, for adjuncts, um, for people who are staff, for people who are GIS specialists to all serve on dissertation committees and diversify the committee, it will reflect to the student that there are lots of different ways to be an academic beyond just being the professor, right? Um, but that means that I have to step backwards and then I have to let other people who are practitioners in the field be the head of dissertation committees instead of just me and my other fellow professors, I think. I got a grant uh, from the Mellon Foundation this year at the Graduate Center uh, for about two and a quarter million dollars to set up um, a, fun, a grant called, uh, a program called Transforming Doctoral Education. It's, uh, fun Mellon is funding uh, 12 students per year starting next year, uh, and they're going to pursue a course of doctoral education that's modified both in terms of the courses that they take and they're not going to teach. Uh, every year, they'll only teach for one, about one and a half years. The other years, we're putting an enormous amount of work into creating other experiences for them, internships, work in labs, work in firms, including law firms and banks, um, to, to all with a view to preparing people for the idea that a great doctoral education prepares you for many careers, not just a tenure track position. I'll just say that we've had a difficulty attracting students to apply because yeah. They sense that there's a loss there too, right? They come to graduate school wanting to be already tenured professors. So we have to address that, that sense of loss in advance and, and uh, again, promote this as plus, not, not negative. It's not a failure. It's not a failure. It's not a failure. <laughs> it's not a So there are solutions out there. Check our website. <laughs> All right. Uh, getting back briefly to the, the struggling question for classics, at a more formal and I think larger level, we need allies and it's important to recognize that they are out there. Uh, at my institution, 
one of my service duties is helping run a conference for 3,500 medievalists every spring. And I talk to a lot of them, and let me tell you, they're dealing with the almost exactly same struggles that we are down to fights over white supremacy, which is a whole separate issue. Uh, and this last fall, the dean of my college wanted to nix the Latin major, and I can tell you that if it had been me and our one Latin professor and our one Greek professor fighting that fight, we would have lost. But our 15 medievalist colleagues stepped up and wrote to her and stormed her office talking about how important Latin was for them, and we saved the major and we saved the graduate program. I'm not saying that medievalists are by any means the only allies for us. I think there are a lot out there. They just happen to be the ones that I know. But I think that if we keep thinking of ourselves as the only other people that we can reach out to are people who deal with the ancient Mediterranean before the year 500, then we're not getting as much help as we can. Um, I do not want to be a buzzkill, but uh, I'm going to anyway. Uh, you know, we, we talk, we've been talking for years about valuing other things, valuing outreach, valuing pedagogy, valuing all of these other things that are not the rigorous philology. And it, uh, it nonetheless seems like getting those rigorous philology publications in the top journals uh, are what get people jobs. And so it, we, you know, it, there's a lot of, of talk about these things, but a lot of the people that are wanting to do that work aren't going to have a permanent place in the field, right? They're gonna be going these other routes and we're not gonna see them at conferences and we're not gonna hear from them because it's hard to come to the SCS if you, you, know, if you don't have institutional support. And so um, I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about what the, the SCS or broader institutions can do to, you know, we, we talk about this, but it feels a little bit like um, empty rhetoric when you see where the, the permanent jobs go. So um, I don't know if you have, <laughs> have thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, all kinds of thoughts. Um, so I, I, would, I would ask of all of the folks who are uh, sitting on search committees this year or involved in a search of any kind at any level to reflect on the kinds of questions they ask of candidates that script and enact a set of professional expectations that replicate this standard, this specific standard, one that uh, sidelines, marginalizes, or occludes the practice of things like outreach, one that um, fetishizes, I love that verb because it is a fetish, um, the, the pursuit of publication in a certain set of carefully circumscribed venues as representing the apex of production in the field and the primary pathway to attaining status in the field. And especially in the case of search committees that are hiring at uh, institutions that um, have R1 status uh, or that uh, imagine themselves as R1, um, uh, the, the, the desperate effort to identify what will the monograph look like. And so I, I, I set this out because I think that we, we are engaging at this conference and in the entire litany um, of activities um, that define and instantiate uh, this discipline for newer generations of academics in a set of rituals that communicate, irrespective of whatever words come out of our mouths about outreach, clear expectations about what matters and what doesn't matter. So how many times are people being asked, well, you know, tell me a little bit more, not just about this outreach program, but like what your vision for outreach is over the next 10, 15, 20 years? What kinds of communities do you want to work with? Um, what kinds of training do you see as necessary for your own formation to make you a more effective interlocutor with those communities, right? And a more effective advocate for those communities? Are those questions being asked? Do you need trauma training? You know, this is something that's been very much on my mind recently um, in order to do that kind of work effectively and well. And will any institution that takes you on board uh, as a tenure track um, appointment be sufficiently attuned and sufficiently supportive to the broad range of skills that you will need to develop in order to do this work at the highest level possible. 
That is the kind of discussion that I think needs to be had if we are going to begin thinking about how to move away from um, structures of knowledge, structures of promotion, structures of credentialing, um, that will, for all that we say we care about outreach, simply restage and reenact uh, the same patterns of domination that we see in evidence here now, right? We have an exhibit hall. Exhibit hall's great. I like spending money there. I always spend lots of money there. Uh, but the exhibit hall indexes the work that we do to the production of books as the, the acme and the cool men of, of, of what we are. Are we about that? Okay, if we're about that, then be about that. But that means that we're not, we're not gonna elevate, uh, we're, we're not being true to ourselves when we talk about outreach. So that, that's where the conversation needs to go. Hi, um, I'm not speaking because I feel like I have any special insights, but rather I feel sort of an obligation because I'm uh, the graduate student co-chair of the new SCS Graduate Student Committee, which I know Joy was instrumental in, in getting started and I think is a very valuable institutional change um, to, 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 to this body. Um, so I, from my perspective, graduate students are expected to act more and more like first year professors. We're expected to teach, we're expected to, I, well, he's done that, but we're expected to publish. We're increasingly feeling all of these pressures to act not like a student, but like a junior scholar. Um, and, and I think that for me, a remedy to the anxieties and the angst of, of, the, of the fear of, of the potential of me not entering the field is the reminder that I am in the field and I'm a necessary part of the field as a graduate student. Um, and so as such, I feel like there is, could be benefits to giving graduate student seats at more tables. And so I think the graduate student committee is a really valuable uh, goal in that. I think in the department level, creating graduate student representative positions, giving us uh, seats on various committees, making these decisions, um, and giving us more seats maybe in the SES could be an opportunity. Um, for example, while I know where we don't have dissertations yet, we know less than you. I mean, uh, we're still in training. M maybe a seat on the program committee or something like that where we actually have decision-making uh, stakes in this body. So I guess my question is how do you think that graduate students, how can we create frameworks and incenti uh, incentives for graduate students to be leaders in this field in ways like that? I, uh, I, I think that it's this is not a cop-out when I say that um, oftentimes one of the things that we discuss when we're putting people on committees, and particularly when we pick new members of the communication committee, is how much should we put on graduate students, right? Because you already oftentimes are TA in a class studying for your exams. You have so much on you, so can we go to a graduate student and say, um, now you have to do some heavy committee work? Because it, it is a, a fair amount of investment in administration. And so while I think it is incredibly valuable, you're right, and the representation is there, one fear I have, um, so I don't have a complete solution, but I do have a fear that if we put too much on you guys, that it will crush you, right? That, that, that having too much committee work will just be overwhelming. So um, yes, I absolutely believe more representation and inclusion for graduate students. That's why on the blog we increased the number of graduate students that write because of the model of Adelon, right? Because we, we include about 25% more graduate students and contingent faculty now, in part because of what Adelon did to exemplify that, okay, they can handle writing a blog post on top of um, their studies and doing. So I, I take your point that, that um, it, there should be more inclusion. I'm also simply scared that we're gonna ask too much of you when already I have had multiple graduate students come to me with mental health problems and tell me it's too much pressure. They're overwhelmed, they're leaving the field. And this is a regular thing as a DGS that you are also a therapist and it's scary. So that's my only fear I wanted to share. Uh, even though I am supportive of, of having more representation of graduate students. Uh, just a, a, a quick thought just, just came to me, and this, this wouldn't solve these, this structural problem that Sarah talks about. I mean, it's a weird paradox that you know, you know, you know, tenured professors like me 
you know, who have so much um, um, given to us. You know, we spent a lot of our time trying to avoid committees and administration, but at the same time, the field's never going to change you know, unless you know, people who actually can be change agents do that. So this doesn't solve it, but like, you know, here, here's one thing the organization could do. And the SES has much less money than you can imagine. You know, the SES is not a rich organization. But um, you know, if, we could, if, we could, if we could endow a one semester studentship every year for a graduate you know, to actually be paid to do a, a, a load-bearing committee function in the organization, uh, that, that, would, that would at least show that we recognize, because what you very powerfully say, which is that it's not that you guys are training to be in the profession. You're in the profession. Uh, you are our lifeblood. You know, and, you know, and, and um, in my university, you know, we would not still have a classics major were not for the work our TAs do getting students into our classes. You know. So, um, yeah, like, you know, yeah, if, if it were a reachable thing, uh, I'd love for there to be like an administrative fellowship. Now, t 10 years ago, when they said that might look like a dent in your CE because it shows you're not serious about doing scholarship all of the time, hopefully in our new world where we're realizing we need to be multitaskers as academics, having a, you know, a professionally recognized time that you spent doing serious academic administration could be a plus on your CV. Um, thank you for this wonderful presentation um, and discussion. Um, what's, what strikes me is that what, what is now and what will be in the future is that not all classics majors will become classicists. And how are we setting them up for success outside of their undergrad, beyond their undergraduate experience? Um, I do think that, you know, I see regularly articles come out about how CEOs want to recruit liberal arts majors. The future of Silicon Valley will be in the humanities. And I, I think in terms of filling those classrooms, addressing the question of how is, what is this going to do for me out, uh, what, what sort of job is this going to give me? Um, I think the classics does provide a certain way of thinking that is valuable um, in life and in careers that will lead to certain successes. Um, and, and you know, I, I do know a venture capitalist who went on to do, he got his uh, degree in the political science, went on to do an MBA, thought he was doing great because he had his MBA, but when he really reflected on it, it was the political science degree that he felt made him stand out and be more successful against some of his uh, competition or peers. Um, so I think as we think about this issue in the future and filling these classrooms, addressing this idea of what, are, how are we making students think in a certain way that will then lead them to great careers and great lives, um, no matter what they do. Yeah. Thanks. That's, I, I, I'll add to your, uh, your comment that uh, and, and coming back to this issue of loss and change, that, uh, and, and, and also picking up on Denell's challenge to the search committees of this year and beyond, which is a crucial point, that it would be an interesting exper experiment for all of us here uh, to leave this SCS and spend the time that you would have spent, uh, those of you who are in the um, R1 institution that gives you the, the time and the support to produce articles like, you know, for the journals Denell reviewed, to use that time differently this year uh, and focus on increasing enrollments or focus on thinking through with your doctoral students why they're in graduate school and what they want the field to be in the future. Uh, and I'll, I'll just say that in, in conversations I've had over the years with colleagues who are, who are trying, they really are genuinely trying in different institutions to reach out to more undergraduates, to teach more innovative courses, and they say, we're, we're trying, but it's just not working. The students aren't showing up. Um, it's really hard. And yes, it's really hard, but my question now is, are we spending enough time on it? And if we really in engineered a massive reinvestment in the time that we spend just for one year as a field, what would it look like at the end of that year? What kinds of ideas would we produce? What kind of courses would we develop? But it would involve a redirection, a reinvestment of energy. It could not be an add-on. It couldn't be something you do on a Friday night because your movie you know, on Netflix didn't run. It would have to be a major reinvestment and redirection of time and energy. I would like uh, to raise two points that have been with us implicitly but not made, um, not been made explicit so far. 
The first one goes back to the question that um, has been raised about 15 minutes ago. What can the SES do? And I'm not now talking specifically about the, um, the points that have been raised by uh, you, Danielle, about the journals and the points that have been raised about the less than perfect representation of historically marginalized groups in the panels and so on and so forth. And that is a very simple and elegant solution to that, which has been tried and tested and has proven that it works. It's called a quota. It's had a 50% quota for all SES panels for, for people who mustn't be men. You're gonna have more women talking on, on panels set a quota of, I don't know how much percent of non-white people who are presenting while publishing in journals it's gonna work, it's gonna take time, yes, and you'll have to, we have to develop some skills to find those people and to motivate those people to actually come forward and step forward and talk and write and publish and do great things because they are there, they are out there, they are out there. And we can actually do that and we can achieve that and it doesn't cost anything and it's not a big deal. So that's the first point I would like to make. And the second point is about what many of you have mentioned about how do we sell our departments, how do we sell what we are doing to the administrators, how do we sell that to the deans, how do we um, not get cut out, how do we not lose funding and so on and so forth. And in all this, these discussions, several very good points have been made and I would just like to broaden the spectrum a little bit. I would like to encourage all of you, especially those of you with tenure, to start thinking about less about how can we do something against the administrators and think more about how can I become one of the administrators? How can I become someone who actually gets to make the decision? So I would like to encourage all of us, graduate students, undergrads, professors, adjuncts, and so on and so forth, to run for these offices, start and run for the dean, run for the provost, run for however these positions are called in this funny country. And actually enact the change that we'd like to see. And then once we've done that, let's, let's dream a bit bigger, run for the school boards in our local communities, run for our local legislative and executive positions, run for state senate or whatever. It's gonna take time and not all of us will make it and we have to get some extra training in that, but we can do it. Those of you who are in one of the two major parties, go and make your voices heard, don't just simply vote every two years, but talk to the people who are supposed to represent you and try to enact the change that we would like to see. There is a quote, I don't know who said it, um, but I think it's very, very on the nose. Change is made by those who show up. And if you sit in nice, uh, uh, nice conference rooms and talk about what we would like to see and what we would like to think, nobody's gonna listen to us. But if we get, if we get out into the world, run for these positions and lose nine, nine times out of 10. Yes, and that's not gonna be nice, but one time out of 10 we're gonna win. And then we're gonna be in a position in which we can actually enact the change that we would like to see. So I would like to encourage all of you to get out of the ivory tower and get out of the glass tower of universities and get into the administrator's office and into the office of politicians. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, the, the nice hotel rooms that are, are, are freezing, uh, that are an ice block, <laughs> like shaking, I'm so cold. I mean, I, I just wanted to um, add something to, to, to what you recommended, and uh, certainly we have quite a, a, a fair number, a, 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 a nice assortment of administrators in the room. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I, I've found to be quite dispiriting, and, you know, I'll, I'll admit to um, having fallen into this trap myself, is, is this habit on the part um, of folks uh, in departments sometimes uh, to, to put down administrators um, and, and say things like, well, I, I actually heard this. It was very fresh in my mind. Um, well, you know, they were, they, they, were, they were academics who couldn't quite hack it. Uh, now they're in administration and we can outsmart them. It's fine. I was, and my response was, we are not gonna outsmart them. <laughs> and uh, this attitude will get us nowhere. Um, and if they were to retaliate vindictively at us upon finding out that we are in fact saying these things, well, that, that's the right thing. Uh, that, that's, that, that's the right thing. Um, but I, I take very much to heart your encouragement to, to really embrace the, 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 the commitment to pursue administration, uh, to assume positions of leadership at our universities that um, make us um, not just sort of visible to the undergraduates or graduates beyond our departmental walls, but that uh, help place us on the map of these institutions um, as folks who are committed to the overarching projects um, that uh, drive the future of these institutions, right? Um, and uh, unavoidably, we, we have local commitments and local concerns, right? I mean, part of the, uh, this, this 
this panel is christened the, the future of the classics because we're animated by uh, some anxieties about the future of this particular disciplinary space. Uh, but uh, as, as, as responsible citizens and as stewards um, of, uh, a, 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 of, a, of a civic culture uh, reflected in the educational institutions of which we are a part, I, 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 we should very much embrace leadership um, beyond our departments uh, as one of the cornerstones of our identities. How that is valued though, um, and how that is valued, especially, but not only in the context of things like, say, graduate admissions or undergraduate recruitment or tenure and promotion decisions. This is where we again get to the question of how ultimately uh, priorities are, are dissonant or not in full alignment with um, the rhetoric that we use and the conversations that we're having here. Right. So when we're, when we're talking about the, the future of classics and our profession, there's another, there's an elephant in this room that we've barely talked about. And this is this, the future of Latin in the high schools and the schools of our country. And I think it's indicative of, of us as college professors that we really haven't talked about this. We're in our ivory tower. The real challenge is in the schools. We all should be working closely with the high school teachers in our communities to make sure they get the support they need to maintain their programs. We need to make sure that our communities are educated about the value of classics so that when high school programs are challenged, the, the parents of a community will go out and say, classics is important, we want Latin in our community. Those Latin students are the students who are gonna come to your, school, your classes. And, and they, they, are, they are the future. How many of you have been to an American Classical League Summer Institute where you can share your expertise with high school teachers at a very exciting summer session? How many of you are even members of the American Classical League? You all, everybody's hand should have gone up just now, but very few of you did. Just keep in mind that Latin, the future, the real future, is in the high schools. I, I would agree. Iowa does not have Latin in the high schools. Um, yes, I, I take your, I, what I'm saying is um, I, I want to go back to what Joy talked about, about decentering the languages, because I find that going to high schools and speaking with high schoolers and middle schoolers, which I regularly do, oftentimes it's part of the AIA as opposed to the, as opposed to the SCS, talking to them about classical archaeology, material culture, visiting history high school classes as well. It's not just Latin. Let's not just hold our hats on the languages as the gateway to classics. We need to also focus on history courses, on culture courses, on religion courses. There are a few biblical scholars in this room, like Young and Carrie Schroeder, who I believe are here. I see them at SBL. I rarely see other classicists talking to synagogues and churches about religion and classics is also another way. So I take the point that Latin is important in high school. I, in Virginia, started taking Latin in ninth grade, but that's not the only route. That's not the only place to go and do outreach with high schools and middle schools. It's not just the languages. We have to diversify and think about lots of different ways to bring in new classicists that are not just philology based. Yeah, just a very, very quick footnote. You know, uh, you know, in my department, we try to educate ourselves um, uh, in this. You know, we now have a um, you know a college Latin and high schools program. But you know, basic things we didn't know until ten years ago were, um, you know, if you're going to invite high school teachers on campus, you need to give them clock hours. There are things called clock hours you need to know about. Um, there's all sorts of this, you know, small structural ways in which we need to know more about how the high school community works because, uh, as you say, it is our, it is our lifeblood. Uh, the, the other thing I was going to say is um, uh, we always had a, uh, um, a, uh, a conference for high school uh, uh, teachers connected to classics, um, but we, um, we did a, uh, a conference on teaching the Odyssey because the one thing that's taught in all Seattle public schools is the Odyssey as part of language arts. Yeah, in English, in English in ninth grade. So having a conference for language arts teachers in the Odyssey introduced us to a whole other K-12 teachers.
teacher constituency that we hadn't encountered before. So that's just a small thing, but you know, you, you, you're absolutely right. You know, we have to think much more proactively about that kind of thing. I just wanted to raise the issue of mentorship of um, visiting faculty, adjunct faculty. I teach at a small liberal arts college, and I think that's one of the perhaps obvious things, but one of the things that we've come to appreciate more and more the value of. I think we're, I believe we're in our department, we're all people of goodwill, but there's a certain stage at which I think the many one-year people who have come through our system will oftentimes I would imagine feel abandoned or have so in the past as they're sort of fending off their things as we're dealing with all of our stuff. And I think we've attempted a, a more um, vigorous effort at mentorship and I think maybe the most emotionally intelligent member of our department is under, is, is the one who's uh, dealing with that at, at present, but mentorship is itself a very vexed issue, how to do it in a non-oppressive way. The, the needs will shift with each person and this will also, of course, change from, uh, you know, depending on the size and structure of the institution. But some of the things, at least as a practical kind of Band-Aid measure that we're talking about needing to be introduced in PhD programs, to some extent, could be addressed uh, in some fashion in, through mentorships. You know, some uh, one-year people are very, you know, technology literate and so forth. Others have just, I mean, just <laughs> managed to survive at, you know, in their institutions with a wonderful PhD and, and would benefit from being introduced to those things by their colleagues. Anyway, any thoughts you have would be welcome. Uh, I'd add that mentorship should not end just with getting tenure, uh, or I mean, getting a job and then getting tenure. Atul Gawande wrote a great piece in The New Yorker a couple of years ago about coaching in one's 40s and how useful he found as a surgeon, although he had to explain carefully to his patients why he felt the need for a coach. But, uh, but, uh, but I, would, uh, I would emphasize at every stage, mentoring should be a collaborative exercise among a more than one, to, uh, not a one-on-one -on -one relationship but a collective collaborative enterprise. And I would say we have a lot of thinking to do as a field too about collaboration and publishing as, uh, as well because collaborative advising with two or three people in a group uh, working with a student or more than one student will lead I think to more inventive and innovative ways of publishing and thinking about uh, the production of scholarship. I need to just um, to do my job. I, I'm giving what should now be the five minute warning. I'm, I'm not gonna close this session down. I don't know if anybody has to come in directly afterwards. Um, but um, uh, if we can keep our questions and answers on, on the brief side, we'll keep, we'll keep talking, uh, leave when you have to, uh, when they bounce us out, we'll leave, we, we will leave, but I, I, I'd like everybody to have a chance to keep talking, so carry on. <laughs> um, thank you all. Uh, the um, logic of the labor market of life in American capitalism tends to make us selfish and solipsistic. I've got mine, you know, I don't need to worry about other people. And a common thread through everything that I think has been said here today is how much solidarity we all have with others in the field, people who enjoy less security than us, people with different job titles than us, people with less privilege than us. But I particularly hope that all of my colleagues in the room who have tenure track positions at R1s, at Ivies, at these places that our colleague who spoke of department closures said where we consider ourselves secure, I hope that all of my colleagues who fit th that description are listening to all the solidarity that we should feel and that we should act with our colleagues who are on the front lines of all the problems that we have been talking about. And that's a solidarity that is not just um, applauding or liking on social media. It is something we live and we act every day in our jobs, on our search committees, when we say hi to someone or don't at a conference. Um, we, must, we must act and live the pain of acknowledging how bad things are and can be and the sacrifice that will be entailed in working to make them better. Um, it is easy to keep doing what we have always been doing when we see our enrollments being flat. Um, that is easy. That is comfortable, and I think that we, uh, those of us who enjoy that position of putative security, and it is only putative, um, we need to lead from that position of security. We need to use that security to do the work to help our colleagues and not assume that we are on such high ground that the waters will never touch us. Speaking of waters, 
um, and at the risk of pulling in another elephant into the room, when we talk about future, when we engage in futurology and we talk about the future, we imagine a society that will be configured more or less the way the society we live in is configured now. Um, if we are listening to what scientists are telling us, the world will be very different in 40 years. Society may look very different in 40 years. So we are not just talking about rebuilding a discipline or reshaping a discipline for the society we live in now or want to live in. We are talking about building a discipline and a profession that can weather much worse stor storms than anything we've ever seen. And I wonder if that's something that any of you have thought about. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna, uh, my, my very quick answer to this, uh, to something that is really the, the project of a, of a, of a, of a, of a collective, um, is that in preparation for the rhetoric panel last year, I was rereading uh, this uh, essay by, by Justin Stover on, uh, on um, uh, the humanities and on, on the crisis of university education. Um, and he had very sort of provocatively started out by saying that there, there is no defense for the humanities. But then he had sort of imagined the scenario in the piece in which uh, the, the transmission of, of knowledge sort of continues um, in the face of, you know, potentially sort of dystopian uh, apocalyptic scenarios, much in the same ways that occurred in previous centuries. You know, there's a kind of T.S. Eliot-esque uh, um, uh, rumination uh, there on, um, you know, reading, reading Virgil as, 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 as London's being bombed or whatever. Um, and this was all sort of crafted um, with a view to authorizing uh, a discourse of classics as, as that which lives because it is valued by a very, very small community of people, right? And I, I found this to be repellent. I mean, I, 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 I disavow this vision um, because I find that it does not give me uh, the, the ethical ground upon which to construct uh, not just a, 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 ro a robust disciplinary practice that can weather these storms, but um, a practice that uh, is rigorously attuned to what it will mean to exercise stewardship and citizenship uh, in a world that is drastically changing and will continue to uh, undergo these, these vicissitudes, right? Um, so that, that's the, when we talk about, say, the sort of the potential death of the discipline, as we were discussing briefly last year at the rhetoric panel, I, I would encourage all of us to think seriously about, you know, what happens if, if the discipline does die, right? Um, and if, if, in fact, our world changes in ways that make this pursuit not rise to the status of other pursuits that may, in the end, be <laughs> more conducive to our long-term survival. Um, it's, it's one thing, I think, in university contexts to embark on a defense uh, of, of what we do as classicists that appeals to um, a, a differentiated ecology of knowledge, right? Um, to say that, you know, really what we want to do is, 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 is cultivate these gardens. Um, but again, earlier, um, one of the questions raised um, brought to the fore the sort of the, the utilitarian dimension of why we teach what we do and sort of making it clear to people that, well, you know, there, there are skills that they can take from classics. And I, I, I'm, I, I'm sometimes over harsh on, on these lines uh, in, in um, assessing, engaging the validity of these kinds of arguments. Um, but what I find sort of edifying about uh, the, the practice of uh, pursuing classics um, is that the allocation of pleasure is a political act, right? So if I think of the pleasure that I have derived from the study of this field, for all of the frustrations that I've had in it, I can't separate my pleasure from uh, my pleasure from the recognition that this is a pleasure whose allocation is differentially and unequally uh, distributed, right? And moving on in the future, we are going to see even more of these disparities in allocation, um, disparities that extend. Uh, up and down the socioeconomic spectra, up and down racial and ethnic lines. Um, and so the question that the field would then have to reckon with, if it is to devise a long-term conspectus for survival in the face of a dramatically altering world, is how to remain committed um, to an equitable distribution of this pleasure that is the classical. And if it can't answer that, then well, I, you know, again, as we were saying earlier, then I'm good. You know, I walk away, I'll do some other things. I'm good. Hi. Um, I, my heart is still pounding from the diatribe earlier, so I wanted to thank you guys for your vigorous um, responses uh, first. But I also wanted to think about um, 
I really appreciate talking about like 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years out, but I wanted to think about turning the conversation maybe to like what we do next week when we go back to our classrooms. Um, and so I just wanted to share, and I, I think systemic change like has to come from um, our individual accountability as teachers, like on a daily basis. So I just wanted to share two suggestions and then I would love to hear yours, obviously. Um, one is that in my second year of teaching, I started doing a self audit um, before submitting my final grades where I divide up all of my um, grades by gender, by race, by a variety of colors and different things. And obviously no one classroom that I have is just like has enough students to have statistical significance, but I think it's still important to like see and interrogate if there are any outlier, outlying issues, um, whether I am giving um, a fair evaluation in particular because young people um, grow in the direction of praise. Uh, and fairness. Um, so it was one, one suggestion I had. Um, and it can be also an exercise in self-humiliation to see where you're embedded in this. Um, but it's private. It's just in front of your own computer, and you can delete it later. Um, and then the second one um, is that uh, you can also just ask your students like what constitutes a microaggression to them like on their campus. And um, like have there been any times like when I failed to protect you? Uh, in uh, the course of the last semester. I suggest doing this maybe after they've finished your class so they don't feel like the pressure to perform for you and say like, oh no, you're great. Um, so I think that those are, those are just two suggestions that I have that I've like, come up with to hold myself accountable sort of on a more quotidian basis. Um, and I was wondering if you guys have any um, sort of daily practices that you would like to share uh, with us so that we can think about um, the long term as being something that we build uh, with every uh, semester and every week. I think your focus on pedagogy is right since almost all of us in this room, uh, many of us teach, whether it's in libraries or whether it's in classrooms or as professors. Um, for me, uh, I've had to evaluate a, a lot of um, how I don't single out um, and yet still make feel included um, my students of color in a school that uh, is close to 90% white, um, right? So, so um, feeling as though um, I uh, support my students of color and yet don't make them feel as though they're outliers within the class or that I am um, focusing too much on them um, to the other students. Um, Part of that is, is uh, as Danielle mentioned earlier, going through the syllabus and then allowing the syllabus to speak to them. Um, I know all of uh, many of us will be formulating our syllabi, <laughs> putting finishing touches in the next week, and thinking about the readings that we do and we choose to include. One reason I write open access articles is because they are free, um, and that allows for anybody to read them, not just using articles from the journals that were mentioned today from C and from AJP, including Adelon articles, but also Forbes articles from Christina Kilgrove, um, from many other writers that are out there. So really what I've tried to do in particular is to think very hard about my syllabus and what that syllabus then represents and says to my students on a day-to-day -day basis. When I write my own um, pieces, I go through and I count how many women, how many people of color, um, what the status is of every source that I speak to um, and every person that I cite. And some articles are better and some articles are worse, but um, if I hold myself to account numerically, um, then I don't forget that it's important. Um, and so, yeah, uh, part of, for me, citation practices and syllabi are huge um, daily things that I think about. Um. Yeah. So very quickly, uh, so uh, Kate, I, I've also been using a version of the self-audit and looking at patterns in uh, end-term grades and assignments um, uh, in grading. Ever since I noticed while I was doing uh, graduate teaching at Stanford that I was really, really coming down like a, like a, ton, like a pile of bricks on students of color, right? I mean, this is, this is like, this is the, this is the internalized self-hate business, right? I mean, this is the... Um, exactly, yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly it. Um, and, and then the other thing that I, I would say in terms of pedagogical practice, something that I've 
um, tried to take more seriously over the past several years is I, I had this in, incredible uh, Latin teacher in high school whose excellence in sort of attending to my needs as a student only became clear many years later when I was teaching. She, I mean, there, there were many, there were some issues with, with her teaching and her performance of Latin pedagogy, but um, she really listened to us, like very carefully. She just sat there and listened. And so I, I just try to listen um, and see what I can learn from what students are telling me, what they're not telling me. Um, try to make use of resources on campus if there are any for uh, things like trauma training or like how to deal with anxiety. Um, uh, I, I do academic advising at my institution. I, I imagine that there are folks in the room who have done or are continuing to do academic advising. Um, and that to me has been incredibly eye-opening because it has made me aware of all of the small gestures I make in a classroom that can make a student feel uncomfortable. And conversely, all the small gestures in the classroom that can make a student feel more welcome, right? Yeah, took a second for my comment to crystallize because it's a, it's a delicate issue because this making the comment I'm about to make can um, lead to the sense that, or, or the reality, that, that different kinds of marginalizations uh, get, can get pitted against each other, okay? So I'm, I'm saying this in the awareness of, of the of the risk uh, of, of sounding, of, of, of taking up that discourse. Uh, but I don't want us to forget poverty um, and, uh, and socioeconomic class as an issue. Um, CUNY as a university, the City University of New York, is made up of 24 colleges, about 275,000 full-time students, and about 40% of them come from families that make under $20,000 a year. It's really a university of poor people, and a vastly disproportionate number of those people are people of color. Um, there are also white people in that group, so, uh, and, and the shame and the anxiety attached to acknowledging poverty and disadvantage is intense. Uh, so again, I say this well aware, I don't want to pit socioeconomic class against race and gender and, and get into a very unproductive discussion about what's worse or who suffers more. It's not the point here, uh, but just to call attention to that issue too. I see Stephen saying to be brief, so I'll be very brief. Thank you very much. Uh, one worry I have about decentering the languages, which is not about holding philology as the final endpoint of classics, is if we take that to its conclusion, it's only going to end up being taught at very elite institutions. And because of this nexus of everything you've mentioned of wealth, race, immigration status, and educational trajectory, um, I think it would be at cross purposes with diversifying our undergraduate students and then eventually professors in the field. Um, and this is anecdotal for anyone who didn't get to take, you know, six years of Latin and a year of Greek before coming to college, you know, anecdotally from my own experience um, and from my students' experiences. So that's just one worry I have, and I don't, I don't know if people have thoughts on that or just something else to consider that that's part of the worry of completely decentering languages. So I teach history of Latin and three years of Greek in high school, and I was oh, going to speak next. <laughs> We do, and I, I wanted to mention that. So I teach at an independent school and have for the last 30 years. Um, and, and I do teach nine years of Latin and, and three years of Greek in our school. Uh, last year, 10% of our graduating class got a classics diploma, which meant they took five years of Latin and two years of Greek. They read Homer, they read Plato, they read Virgil. We're a tiny, tiny group, but I have to say two things about independent school Latin and Greek. Uh, all the kids who graduated last year with classics diplomas from my school looked for colleges first for classics. We have alums who are here today. Um, we have uh, alums who help them find schools with classics programs. So I, I know we're a, a little tiny group, but, but please don't ignore the fact that, um, as you said, an independent school alum, these, these kids head out there to find classics programs. So, so I would hate to see the, the discipline uh, wither away because our kids love it. The second thing is graduate students teaching in, in independent schools is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, I have colleagues with PhDs. I have colleagues who publish. Um, there are, as we heard, great conferences. Um, there are, are ways to keep teaching what you love teaching. And the idea that, that maybe you, you need a teaching certificate is true for, for public schools, but not for private schools. Uh, it, it's really people who love their discipline 
and can teach it. And so, so I don't know, I know we have uh, here, the only K-12 thing is a T that happens in the middle of another session, uh, which I would much rather attend, but I'll go to the T to sort of support the one thing for K-12 teachers. Um, it would be good if in the future, uh, more of those things could happen. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who is involved in this panel and the planning of it. This has been so amazing. And to everyone here who was so supportive at the very beginning of this very dramatic um, opening of the discussion part. Um, I wanted to bring it back to just kind of like, you know, some concrete things going forward, what comes out of this discussion. Um, one thing that might be helpful is for the S uh, SES to, I don't know, um, have maybe theme years where, you know, this year, 150 years, great. So then maybe a theme could be um, panels or, or committees or something like that on um, how one might go about, um, or how departments might go about reframing their curriculum in order to create some classes that break out of these kind of, you know, Roman history, Greek history, Greek art, right? Because I think that is what replicates some of this kind of, when you hire, then it's like, well, we have to, you know, our, our Roman historian is hiring, we have to hire a Roman historian. It's actually, actually no, right? So if the courses themselves are thematized, they're meant to appeal to and be accessible to a broader range of students, that means that you then open up who you you hire for in terms of visiting positions, tenure track lines, um, interdisciplinarity and things like that and it gives um, junior faculty, you know, um, visiting faculty more opportunities to develop in areas where they might become then more flexible in um, the, on the job market or in other, you know, um, career paths and things like that. So it would be awesome to have maybe some best practice documents and things like that. I remember um, long ago being really grateful for a document on how to go to the job market and like interview at the SCA, APA at the time. Um, those kinds of documents um, would be really, really helpful for well-meaning people who want to do all of the things, um, but you know, there's no guidance out there. Um, our department brought Rebecca Kennedy over to do a workshop and we revised our entire curriculum and we've broken everything apart and, um, and it's gonna be easier to, you know, change things. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a, as a, a project that maybe someone might want to take um, on uh, to have some things actually come out of this. But thank you so much for, for all of this. Thank Amazing. you, Yuri. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, no, I, I was going to say, do you want to wrap it up too? Yeah. I think, yeah. Great. Well, um, I'll hand it back over to the moderator, but I did just want to say thank you guys so much for coming and participating and, and being a part of this. I think this was extremely eye-opening and, and very productive, and uh, yeah, I'm appreciative. Yes, uh, 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 th thank you to all my panelists here, uh, but thanks especially uh, to all of you. Like, you know, we, you know, these 105th anniversaries are hard. Like, you know, my vision of this panel is this shouldn't just be like, you know, a bunch of old guys in tweed jackets like me. Um, and I think we achieved a, a broader discussion. We, we didn't finish the discussion. We never intended to finish the discussion. Go away. Keep talking about these things for the rest of the day. You know, talk, talk about them over your third glass of wine at the free parties this evening. Talk about it when you go home to your institutions, to your schools. You know, this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, as we saw at the beginning, it can be a difficult conversation, but these are conversations we have to have. These are existential conversations. Thank you so much uh, for all of your help in letting us talk about this. <laughs>